for joining us this evening. Um, I am so pleased um, to be able to um, moderate this, this really exciting conversation. Um, this is an evening with Freedom Rider Joan Trumpower Mulholland, um, who is visiting um, George Mason University to com commemorate 60 years since the Freedom Rides. And um, we are so thrilled today to have this, this conversation with, with Ms. Joan and Dr. Charles Chavis. And I think that you will be so, um, so enriched and, and inspired by, by Ms. Joan's story. So I'm gonna start by just giving, um, uh, reading some bios so that you get to know who's here. And um, then I'm gonna hand it over to our two panelists. There, we have a series of videos that we'll be showing you in addition to um, conversation that will happen. So um, with that, um, I am so pleased um, to, to introduce um, Ms. Joan Trumpower Mulholland, who's a recipient of the 2015 National Civil Rights Museum Freedom Award. She's a civil rights icon who participated in over 50 sit-ins and demonstrations by the time she was 23 years old. And many of you in the audience are about that age. So she was a freedom writer, a participant in the Jackson Woolworth sit-ins, the March on Washington, the Meredith March, and the Selma to Montgomery March. For her action, she was disowned by her family, attacked, shot at, cursed at, put on death row, and hunted down by the Klan for execution. Her path has crossed some of the biggest names in the civil rights movement, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, John Lewis, Diane Nash, and Julian, Julian Bond. Um, she's appeared in numerous books and documentaries and has received numerous awards and recognition for her work in the civil rights movement including the 2019 International Civil Rights Museum Trailblazer Award, the 2018 I Am a Man Award, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Annual Award of Honor, and the Anti-Defamation League Annual Heroes Against Hate Award. So I'm so pleased that um, Ms. Mulholland has, uh, has joined us this evening. And I'd also like to introduce our, our moderator for the evening, Dr. Charles Chavis Jr. Um, who is the director of the African and African American Studies program at George Mason University. And he is also the founding director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice and Peace at Mason um, and the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution, where he is an assistant professor of conflict analysis and resolution and history. So um, please give, give our, our two um, guests this evening a, a warm welcome and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Chavis to begin the conversation. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Berger. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, while we're getting the videos queued up, um, I want to just take this time to thank Ms. Joan Mulholland for all of her work, her sacrifice, and for really lighting a path for the new generation of leaders, social justice leaders and change makers. Um, and we're honored to have you here at George Mason University, um, Ms. Mulholland, and um, at the African African American Studies Program. Um, and so with that, um, you know, I think it'd be great, Lenitra, if we can start off by queuing up um, an actual segment, specifically a segment detailing background around your experiences and also the experiences of Jim Crow segregation during the 1960s. I mean, during the freedom um, freedom rides, but also um, just providing us insight into what exactly you all were fighting against, right, in terms of Jim Crow segregation. And so we'll cue that up, and then we'll, after the film, um, after the clip, about two minutes, come back, and I'll, I'll present some questions. Okay, and in the film, you'll see a bunch of my old buddies from back in the day and classmates and things, so be good to see them. And this is from the film, An Ordinary Hero, the true story of Joan Trumpier Mulholland. Well, no sound. Walking on the sidewalk, did not get off the sidewalk when a German was coming in, Doc, take his cap off. He was risking his life. So we had that same thing over here. I always wondered why I had to go through the back door of the public library, why I could not go into the stacks to get my own books, um, why I had to go to the colored water fountain. Uh, in Sears, I can remember white ladies and colored women bathrooms. Uh, you had you could not sit at Chris's uh, counters. We used to go downtown and to buy candy or something. We couldn't sit at the counter. Couldn't even uh, go downtown to eat in a lot of the restaurants. Uh, 
pound town in DC. They said we were supposedly equals. We were being treated that way. And I suddenly pissed off this white person. They had all kinds of things at their disposal to take to, to do me in, and there was nothing I could do about it. He said, uh, you ran that light. My dad said, no, sir, I didn't run the light, it was yellow. Morris, I said to you, you ran that light. My dad didn't say anything. And he looked at us in the back seat, and I guess we looked like a nice little family. And he said, um, Morris, you'd like a good so I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you off this time. Well, it was a uh, separate and unequal society, uh, basically buttressed by uh, local customs and laws. But you know, that was that was just the way things were. And you want to go, what do you mean that's the way things were? I met whites all over who had questions raised. I later met blacks who, when they had questions raised, their parents had to tell them, uh, it may be wrong, but don't you try to do anything about it. This is in God's hands. Um, here's how you protect yourself. Maybe you shouldn't ride the bus so much if that upsets you. Your parents did that, but they also told you that it would come to an end because it was wrong. Anything that's that wrong can't last. Wow. Okay, you. and I want to point out that Benny Thompson, who was speaking, he's the guy in charge of the January 6th hearings. Oh, wow. So, and that's one of the things I wanted to kind of bring up too when we think about, Ms. Holland, what we're witnessing today you know, with this unrest around, specifically around issues of race, um, you know, going up against the institution, the federal government, the state and local governments, specifically around Jim Crow segregation. Could you talk to us about what inspired you and what led you to um, participate in this movement and to really take on this system? Well, where I went to Sunday school every week growing up and we memorized these Bible verses about how to live do unto others as you would have them do unto you and love thy neighbor as thyself. And I took that seriously. And when I was about 10 down in Oconee, Georgia, not that fancy resort, but the old company owned logging town where grandma lived, man, that place, it was so poor. The dirt road, the train ran down the middle of the dirt road and the train was called the Nancy Hanks. Sir, do you know who Nancy Hanks was? No, no Googling allowed. That was <laughs> no. Abraham Lincoln's mama. Oh, so my. you know a Yankee owned that train. Okay. <laughs> Same play made every summer, Mary. And when I was about 10, we dared each other to go walk through the colored section of town. Now, for the listeners, colored was the polite term then. Black was fighting words. And, but we didn't call it, call it colored town. You know what we called it, but I won't say it. And we snuck off and did that, strictly forbidden. And man, when folks saw these two little white girls coming down the dirt road, they just made themselves scarce. They quit sweeping their yards as folks did back then. And they went inside the house or out behind it or something. They didn't want to know nothing about us. Well, that was creepy enough to me. And then we got to the colored school that was a one-room shack. And this is all before Brown versus Board. This is a one-room shack, never had a drop of paint on it. The door's ajar. You can see the pot-bellied stove for heat. No glass or screens in the windows. No electricity, I don't think, or running water. There was a hand pump in the yard. And no playground equipment or you know grass or anything. And one outhouse everybody so I say this unisex bathroom thing ain't nothing new they had that no coney well I knew this was not doing what we learned in Sunday school about treating people the way we wanted to be treated and I couldn't have put it in words then but I knew we sort of resolved internally that when I had a chance to make the south didn't care about them Yankees but to make the south the best it could be for everybody I would do it and that came with the sit-ins. Wow. 
and, and just to you know provide background, most people when we think of the sit-ins, when we think of the civil rights movement, we think of the sit-ins, we think of Greensboro, but this was going on as you um, participated throughout the country and throughout the South, um, and, and outside of the sit-ins, you know, when we think about nonviolent protests and the forms of protest, kind of talked with us about how you transitioned from you know sit, the sit-in movement to the Freedom Rides, which will queue up um, our next clip where we talk about the actual Freedom Rides. Okay. Well, all across the South, thousands and thousands of students joined the sit-in, and I joined them in Durham, North Carolina. That's a whole nother story. But when the Freedom Rides got going, I was by then involved with the group at Howard University. Hank Thomas was part of our group. You saw him in that first clip, he was on the Freedom Ride. He's that tall, lanky dude standing by the burning bus. And the other bus, there were two buses, two bus lines, Greyhound and Trailways. The other bus, when they got off um, in Birmingham, they got beaten so bad. Well, the Freedom Rides couldn't continue between beatings and smoke inhalation and everything. Folks were in hospitals and what have you. So following the teachings of Gandhi, that if one can't continue, others must step up to take their place, um, the students who had been sitting in, uh, they came from all over the South to keep the rides going. And um, I wasn't one of the first. Dion, who you saw, um, he was one of the three that left our DC group to keep the rides going. And actually i got a call from one of our guys down in montgomery when they were trapped in the church where dr king was preaching and there was the clan and everything all around it and tear gas coming in the windows where rocks had been thrown in so obviously they weren't getting out that night and each family could send one person or you know group one person to the basement of the church to make a very quick phone call. They had two landlines and your call, I don't remember if it was two or three minutes, but it was timed. And Paul called me back in DC. He knew I had a phone right by my bed. It was, I could just grab it when it rang and he said, Joan, this is Paul. I can't talk. We're trapped in the church in Montgomery. Send more riders. So we got some more folks organized from DC. In fact, we were second only to Nashville and Diane Nash's group um, in the number we sent. And my group, um, and I helped recruit it and it included my buddy Stokely Carmichael. And um, I claim credit for getting him into the deep south. And we flew from Washington DC to New Orleans and took the Illinois Central train back to Jackson. And um, we got off and went in one of the waiting rooms and sat down and Captain Ray told us we had to get moving. But the one thing that to me was the most important in that, it wasn't being on death row and learning to drink coffee. It was that when I stepped out of the paddy wagon, and this would not have happened if I'd been black, but the white cop reached out to take my arm and help me down the big step and said, we don't want anything to happen to you, children. And that gave me faith things would work out. Now, fast forward, and then I'll shut up. 50 years, our 50th anniversary meeting of the reunion of the Freedom Riders, we were having um, breakfast at the governor's mansion out in the lawn. And I noticed that there were, there were some officials that were sort of roped off from the rest of our tables. And I saw these two black policemen. One was the um, head of the state highway patrol. They were in uniform and the other was the head of the Jackson, Mississippi police. I went over there to take their picture and they turned their head on me so fast, didn't get that picture. But then when I told my story of the policeman helping me out of the paddy wagon and that gave me faith it would work out. Man, after that, those two officers were over wanting to get their picture taken with me. Wow. So, you know, it good came out of it. Yes, yes. It, let's go ahead and transition to the um, film. 
Uh, I want to ask you about your um, connection to Stokely Carmichael and your recruitment efforts that brought him um, on to being part of the movement into the larger black freedom struggle. Okay. Let's go ahead really quick. Great. It's about five minutes. Yeah, this was an idea that, that caught the imagination of the country. However, the civil rights community thought it was a bit of a, a lark. Um, they thought, oh, right, we're, you know, we're just going to ride on buses through the South, you know, for a couple of months. Um, it was almost seen as like a vacation. And some of the people who actually participated initially were viewed as, you know, people who were just, you know, slackers. They didn't want to do the hard work of going and demonstrating in front of, you know, uh, hardcore uh, places. So they were just going to take a bus. I think we knew from the start it could be dangerous. On the other hand, maybe to break the tension, maybe half thinking it. Um, we were teasing Hank and him that, you know, hey, you're going off on this all expense paid vacation. Good way to end the semester, buddy. How I spent my summer in 1961. Let me tell you the ways. <laughs> they put together a small group of 13 riders. I think it was 13 who left Washington on two separate buses, making their way through the Upper South. In the Upper South, they were attacked a few times. A couple of people were beaten up, arrested, uh, most notably in Rock Hill, South Carolina. But really all hell broke loose when they got to Alabama. And all of a sudden, it made national news and everybody realized this was not just a walk in the park. This was the next stage of the revolution. I had already had a taste I'd seen the violence. I just barely escaped the Klan. So I had no illusions whatsoever about what was going to happen next. I didn't know anything about Anderson, Alabama. And then we were told that we are literally going into the belly of the beast. Uh, Anderson was a hotbed of Klan activity. And as a matter of fact, uh, Jim Farmer, who was uh, pretty good stump speaker, uh, spoke that night and told a joke about Anderson in terms of foretelling what we were going to be in for it. He said, there was this bus driver driving a Greyhound bus, and as he got maybe three or four miles from Anderson, he heard this knock-knock thumping on the side of the bus, so he pulled over to see what it was, and as he opened the door, the Greyhound had gotten down off of the side of the bus and wanted to come inside. And so when he asked and says, why do you want to do that? He said, we getting ready to go into Anniston. <laughs> and there are variations of that joke of, he said, one preacher said, Lord, we're getting ready to go down to Alabama and we want you to be with us. And then it was silence. And uh, he said, Lord, did you hear me? I want you to be with us. So he heard that voice. I'll go with you as far as Anderson. <laughs> so all kinds of joke about how dangerous it was going to be. And surely enough, when we got maybe a few miles outside of Anderson, we'd all had been singing um, on the bus. And as we did that from time to time, a bus coming from Anderson stopped on the opposite side of the highway. And the two bus drivers got out and spoke. And the driver of our bus got back on and looked, kind of looked at us and just kind of smiled. Um, and uh, as we got into Anniston, the streets were deserted. No one. And it was telling us, this is not good. A mob firebombed the bus as churchgoers brought their children to watch the Freedom Riders burn alive on Mother's Day. Riders were able to escape only to be beaten with baseball bats until the local authorities finally stepped in. Freedom Riders were attacked two more times in Birmingham and Montgomery, where it appeared things would come to an end. But a call back to my mother in DC to send more riders, and a team led by Diane Nash in Nashville, re-energized everyone. However, my mother and the Freedom Riders were now entering Mississippi, a place many would call the heart of darkness. Joan went on an unusual freedom ride. She and a group from Washington, which included uh, the, the activists and later SNCC uh, chairman, uh, Stokely Carmichael, flew from Washington to New Orleans, which is where the freedom rides were supposed to end. 
And from New Orleans, they took a train to Jackson and therefore integrated yet another um, facility, not the bus depot, but the train depot. You stepped off the bus or out of the train and you would, went into the waiting room and together and whether it was the black one or the white one and told to move on and move out. Uh, my Captain Ray, did you all hear me? You gonna do it? You're under arrest. And out to the paddy wagon and from there to the city jail and then, then you had your trial, so-called, which was also down to absolute routine and over to the county jail. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that, Lenitra. And this is just, this is so important. This specific episode is one of the more um, well-known episodes in regards to Freedom Rides, but knowing your role in terms of this re-energizing, I think when we think about the Freedom Rides, you know, and people overlook the strategy that was, you know, and the, the, the power that you all had to really, in many ways, um, overwhelm the system, right? Could you talk with us about that in terms of your strategy and how you know this all came together and um you know a lot of the movements we think about today whether it's blm and others you know we have like this decentralized leadership but in terms of the classical civil rights movement and what we see with the freedom rights there was so much structure and organization around strategy um and could you talk a little bit about that but also share with us a little bit about your, your work with Stokely Carmichael as well. Okay, um, the students had gotten together and on spring break, April of 60, and formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And it was sort of a loosely knit group of students that would, and leave, somebody from each group would, they'd all meet every, every now and again. And, so we were in, in touch with each other. Um, back then it was phone calls and letters and wasn't always the best, but it, you know, it's what we had. And um, so we believed firmly in Gandhi's, Gandhi's teachings. And I figured, well, if it was enough to get um, India what is now India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka out from the British Empire, it was it, it might work for us, but we had specific targets, lunch counters, and it expanded to movie theaters and things. And um, in 19, December of 1960, there had come a Supreme Court ruling that not just the vehicle of transportation, but the um, facilities associated with interstate travel had to be open to everybody equally. And the Freedom Rides were testing that and um, then the call went out for more people to come when they couldn't continue. And then people from the North who had been in sympathy pickets came and joined and we filled the jails, which was the goal and, you know, jail, no bail until the sentences got so high that people would serve as long as they could without losing the right of appeal and then they would bail. Um, but it got so crowded that they took the prisoners on death row at the state prison farm, which was every bit as bad as Angola and Louisiana. I would say it's worse, but that's just personal prejudice. And um, put the death row prisoners someplace a little bit nicer in the prison and put the Freedom Riders up on death row, which wasn't too bad because it was roomier, cleaner, and the food was better than the county jail where they'd had us. I mean, we, were, we had been down to less than three square feet of floor space in the white woman's cell. Um, and that if you didn't count, so some people were sleeping under the bunks, we weren't counting that floor space. And one person slept curled up in a dripping shower stall so it was an improvement putting us on death row, trying to frighten us, but I'm a Southerner, I knew their game, so. Wow. So if you could talk about this this sacrifice, and I think 
recognizing the power, this collective power? At what point, you know, during your work, your activism, your sacrifice, did you all recognize the tide shifting um, from a national level regarding, um, you know, policies around segregation? Um, well, I think when we got the Civil Rights Act, uh, gradually places had been opening up, the national chains and what have you. Um, but an awful lot of stuff was still segregated until the law was, the Civil Rights Act of 64 was passed. And that, that was really good. Oh, you wanted me to speak about Stokely too. Yes, please. Okay, he had been part of our Howard University sit-in group. And um, we got along fine. Black Power came later. But, oh, and I should say that once, particularly the Freedom Riders, the guys who had been involved in the sit-ins got out of jail, they then moved on in some of them into the communities, including Stokely and John Lewis and what have you, um, Bernard Lafayette, they moved into communities in Mississippi to um, try to help folks figure out how to get change and quickly realize if you're gonna have change, you gotta be able to elect the people who make and enforce the laws. So voter registration became an emphasis and Stokely was involved in that. Then they drifted on over to Alabama and continued with that. And um, eventually Stokely, I think as much out of resentment of white Northerners coming down to Atlanta, trying to tell the movement veterans how to do things. I mean, they were from union organizing. It was a little bit different. They, they couldn't sing the songs like they were, they would sound like they were on union picket lines and they didn't know what grits were and they just were not familiar with the culture, but they thought they could tell us how to do things. And that just, you know, really turned off a lot of folks like Stokely. But if Stokely was your friend from back in the day, way back in the day, he was your friend for life. Every time I ran into Stokely, it was, he would go out of his way to acknowledge his old friends. Um, I had my son who made the movie and his twin brother with me to, when we went to hear Stokely speak and must have been about 75, maybe 76, when he was the most feared man in the world to white America. And he was speaking at the Smithsonian. The programs would go all day, take a break. And I went out in the lobby to, with my kids to introduce them to my old buddy. And between the entrance to the museum and where Stokely was in the lobby, there was a close semicircle of bodyguards from the Nation of Islam. Stokely was speaking to a couple of big wigs in suits and ties. I don't remember if they were black or white. I caught Stokely's eyes. He cut off that conversation so fast and motioned me over with his head. Now, remember, this was when he was a holy terror to the world. I said, Stokely, I wanted my sons to meet you. All six foot something of him knelt on the floor to speak eyeball to eyeball to these two little freckled faced white boys, shook their hands. What's your name? How old are you? Maybe what's your favorite animal? And he stood up and I thanked him. And we went on our way. But I mean, I don't know what the nation had to get itself back together after seeing that. And um, he was on his soapbox in Atlanta. Joan Browning, another white freedom rider from Georgia, she was now working in a community center where the kids were making these little candles um, at, in milk cartons and selling those for a dollar a piece. So she was out there on the square listening to Stokely. When he got off his soapbox, he came straight over to her in front of everybody and bought a few candles. And um, another guy from the DC sit-ins, I don't think he was a freedom writer, but Stokely knew him from back in the day and he was speaking out in San Francisco somewhere. And 
Dave asked a question and afterwards apologized, you know, to Stokely. He hoped it was okay that, you know, a white guy asked a question. This was well into black power. And Stokely said, oh, sure. Hey, you drink? Let's go get a drink. That was Stokely to the end, always recognizing and honoring his friendship with his old buddies. I just, I just think it's so important that when we think about the civil rights movement, that you know this whole North versus South, you know, it was big. You know, it's and and you mentioned you know the Washington D.C. the city and people think you know that you know segregation and all these policies were just all in the deep South. But, oh no! You know, before we get into the the next clip, if you could share with us, you know, your experiences seeing this throughout the country and not just. You know the different forms and different ways it manifests throughout the country. Um, you know, being in D.C. and then going to as far as Mississippi. Well, when I was growing up, everything in D.C. was segregated too, just like Reggie said. And man, you didn't. The restrooms were segregated because you know those black folks have diseases. You didn't de definitely don't sit on the toilet seat, and folks couldn't try on clothes or return them and you know in, in the stores and things um the eateries were all segregated we had lots of sit-ins in the dc area the howard group and even the amusement park you know who knew there was the back seat on you know on the merry-go-round but um i was oblivious to the segregation growing up but once i became aware i was with the program of changing it and being white, there were things I could do sometimes, like in, when we went out to the amusement park in Maryland, where I'd always gone as a kid, I could go, I knew where to go and get a handful of tickets because you had to have a ticket every time you got on a ride. I could go back out and hand them out to the black students and they could dash in, ticket in hand and hop on the merry-go-round and get arrested. Yeah. Wow, this is this is great. I'm gonna I want us to go ahead and we will be opening up to the um the rest of everyone here, the audience, for more questions. I know we have some questions that are coming in. Yeah, you gotta we, hush me up because I can talk forever. Listen, no, you're this is amazing. This is we're we're so honored to have you. I wanna just do one more clip before we turn it over to the audience. Um Lenitra, let's queue up the March on Washington um clip and we will bring it over to the audience right after that. Nope, we got the wrong one, but that's okay. That's me getting sugar dumped on my head like I wasn't sweet enough. That was Jackson, Mississippi. Sorry, which one do you want to play? Let's do the March on Washington. Right up. No worries. Well, maybe we'll get it. Yep. Right Through the summer of that was it. my mother stayed in D.C. and focused her energies on helping plan and organize one of the largest human rights rallies in U.S. history, the March on Washington. Up until the march actually took place, till that morning, we were not at all certain it was going to come off. Um, the newspapers had brought up the possibility of riots. Um, store owners downtown boarded up storefronts a bit um, or anticipated problems. The American Nazi Party was just over across the river in Arlington. Um, a lot of people were against the civil rights movement then. And there was even thought that the federal government might bring out troops and prevent the march from happening, that the buses would be halted um, before they even got to the city. So when we went down to the mall early in the morning and there were buses beginning to appear and everything was peaceful and beautiful, um, was, that was a good moment. I didn't get to march. I would, was working back in the press tent handing out, you know, kits or what have you of, of information to 
to the press. And then when it was getting pretty close to time for the speeches, um, they had a van or something that they bust us all up closer so we could hear what was happening. Dr. King had, in his prepared speech, did not have the I Have a Dream the uh, speech that we're all familiar with now, that got added, sort of an inspiration at the end, because I hadn't seen the text of what anybody was going to say. I know John Lewis had to um, censor his a bit and calm it down and make it more appealing to the Kennedys. But um, King went just went off on the I Have a Dream part. It was interesting to me now that it's iconic and it's it's good, but the Washington Post in its coverage of the March on Washington, which was the you know, banner headline, lead story, pictures on the front page, had a Philip Randolph as the number one speaker. Uh, did not even mention Dr. King until you got to where it was you know continued on page whatever. Um, King's Dream, which was not even supposed to be part of the program and not picked up on by the press, uh, is how we remember it. Wow. Thank you so much for that. And like I said, this time we were welcoming questions from the audience. Um, I had a question before I'm going to turn it over. And um, Lenitra or Angela, if we can read off some of those questions once we get them queued up. But my specific question was about this the organizing. I and mean, this, like you said, is one of the most historic moments, human rights moments in our nation's history, the March on Washington. And at the end of it, in many ways, during it, you were working, right? And I think everyone is like, you know, balancing between the participation and the working part of it. Um, you know, could you talk to us about that that work? I mean, you had up to this point already have been, you know, a veteran of the movement and been participating in sit-ins, but as you transition from, you know, this, when we think about service, everyone wants to, you know, be where the action is, but during this most historic moment, you decided to work with the press and then, you know, just, um, so talk about that, that work and how well, you- Well, all summer, I had been, not officially SNCC's representative in the Washington DC office of the March. There were offices sort of scattered about recruiting people to come. I know there was one in New York and I think Chicago, but there were different offices of folks working to get people into Washington for the March. And um, I ended up mainly dealing with the press, typing his stuff and, um, and answering phone calls and all that were coming in, um, press release type stuff. And then since I was working in the press part, I was, they had a special tent up near on near the monument, Washington Monument, um, where the press could come and get further information or, you know, if they hadn't been getting it before. And um, that was my assignment for the day is dealing with the press again. <laughs> well, um, what, one other thing, uh, it's actually slipped my mind, I was going to ask you. Hmm. Oh, I know exactly what it was. You, you highlighted it in the clip, you talked about the watering down, if you will, of John Lewis's speech. Oh, okay. yeah. Let's talk about it. He that. was going to have the students march nonviolently through the South, like Sherman marched through Georgia. Too radical. Yeah, they cut it. <laughs> the Kennedys. Wow, wow. I mean, that's that's what a lot of people don't think about. I mean, the impact at the federal level and even the, I think one of the things about the Freedom Rides Out, always a bunch of my students to kind of understand the power that um, you all wielded and you all really were able to galvanize in getting the direct attention and action of the president during this time. Um, it's something that um, I've always been astonished by. I think it, we have to make sure to highlight the the power that you all had to mobilize um, and really get the pulse and be at the pulse of the president is very important. And I think it's something that we can't overlook. But I'm going to go to the, the Well, question. I want to say, too, that it right. wasn't just filling the jails, which cost money and bad publicity for the country, but you had governors and senators and mayors and everybody 
um, getting reports, visiting the jails, check things out themselves, and report, and you know, then passing that on to the president and his baby brother, uh, Bobby. And so um, we were just trying to get them in to enforce a Supreme Court decision, which had. Oh, I want to tell the story on that. You going to let me? Yes, please, please go right ahead. Okay, back in Selma, Mama Boynton. Amelia Boynton had been working with the NAACP for years on voter registration. Her son, Bruce, was a law student at Howard and he bought a bus ticket to go visit mama. I think it was Thanksgiving, I could be wrong, but some holiday. And he got off in Richmond and went in to get a bite to eat at the wrong lunch counter. And that's the case that made it to the Supreme Court. And so Bruce Boynton's case is what inspired, you know, the freedom rides to check compliance and try to force um, the Kennedys and the governors and all local police to enforce the law of the, by the Supreme Court. And um, in the end, 400 and some arrests later, the Kennedys did ask order the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, to come up with regulations and get the signs down and da 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 but it didn't take effect until November. Well, Mama Boynton had to have been behind her boy. The next time we see Mama Boynton, oh, she was beaten unconscious on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which had been you know, partly stirred up by those SNCC guys getting out of jail and moving over to Alabama on voter registration. Her beating was so bad that President Lyndon Johnson, a powerful, only president because he was a powerful Southern Democrat who could balance out that Catholic Yankee boys ticket. And now he's president. He went on national TV when it was a big deal before a joint session of Congress and t- talked about the beating of Mrs. Boynton and said, we must have a Voting Rights Act and we shall overcome. And then he leaned toward the camera and repeated, we shall overcome the anthem of the student civil rights movement. And that was the death knell of the Southern Democratic Party that had propelled him to presidency. And I've talked to people who are working in the White House. He knew exactly what he was doing and what the repercussions were being. Well, the next time we see Mama Boynton, it's not being beaten on the bridge. It's in a wheelchair, I think age 99, being pushed over the bridge. And she's got Michelle and Barack Obama and Congressman John Lewis, who had also been beaten so badly on the bridge. He's, she's surrounded by them leading the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which I think was just beautiful. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for that, um, Ms. Mullen. We're going to take a question from Ayandela McDowell. Um, and um, the question is, what was the fallout with your family and friends for um, – from such conscious decisions that you made as an adult? What relationships remained and which ones were lost? Well, my mother who grew up in rural Georgia was horrified and embarrassed. And she semi disowned me, wouldn't send any money for me to go to college. Cause when I got out of jail, I went straight out to Tougaloo where I had been accepted in spite of the fact that my high school refused to send my transcripts. But um, mama was horrified. She wanted to do anything she could to keep me away from the deep south. My daddy was another story. He grew up in a small town in southwest Iowa where the town doctor's best friend from his college days in Iowa. This is a pop quiz for you, sir. (laughs) <laughs> would visit and he would have pockets full of peanuts. This was back before, you know, planters peanuts and 
fresh produce year round, and he would throw those peanuts out in the grass for the kids to have a scavenger hunt. He became the hero to every kid in this little town, all white town. Who was his friend with the peanuts? Carver. Absolutely, George Washington Carver. So if you grow up with a black man with peanuts as your hero, you aren't prejudiced. But daddy was afraid that his little girl was gonna get seriously injured, though he totally supported our goals. So my parents had met when they came to Washington DC for the, you know, Roosevelt's New Deal jobs, but they just sort of agreed to disagree on this. But um, my mama softened up a bit and was more accepting of me once they were grandchildren. Grandsons do a lot to soften a mama's heart. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you so much for that. And we have another a question from um, Dr. Yvette Richards Jordan. What were your impressions of Ella Baker? Did you meet Stanley Livingston and Bayard Rushton, the others who, along with Ms. Baker, were a part um, of this friendship? Um, I met them. I didn't really know um, Bayard Rushton. I think I met once somewhere, and Ms. Baker, we crossed paths, but I didn't really know them. So what were your impressions of them, I guess, learning about them during and after, um, you know, your work in the movement? I was not overwhelmingly impressed. Um, Bayard Rustin, yes, I admired him, but Ms. Baker, I know she was a great influence on things, but, you know, on an individual basis, she didn't do anything for me. All righty, no worries. That's a, thank you for that answer. Um, let's see. That might be too honest, but hey. Oh, no, no, there's nothing. <laughs> hey, listen, this is this is great. Um, let, let's go on to Robert Graham here. Whenever I become hopeless about race and race relations in the U.S., I remind myself of the Freedom Riders and the Freedom Summer. I point um, point others to you um, all as well. Uh, what are some other sources of hope and inspiration that I can look to and point others to when it comes to race relations and solidarity in the U.S. today? Well, the marches on Black Lives Matter are huge and they are, there is no majority of anybody in it. It's black, white, Asian, Hispanic, all mixed together. Now we did have a handful of Asians and um, Hispanics, but I mean a very small handful back then. So the way it's been, everybody's in it and the fact that the police are holding hands and marching with the demonstrators and kneeling to pray with them, that to me just blows my mind when I see that. I so, couldn't imagine it, yeah. Well, yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I think is important for students to understand, but also all of us to understand is, you know, how when we think about America, we oftentimes think about you know, America as both domestic and an international power. And one of the things that struck me always about, you know, the history, the overlapping history between the civil rights movement and the larger Cold War struggle is the ways in which, um, you know, the experience here abroad, domestically, like with civil rights and all of this segregation during this time period, you know, it was used in many ways, like, you know, what we saw with Black Lives Matter to, you um, in terms of international powers like Russia and others to kind of show like, you know, these are the issues that are going on in this, you know, so-called beacon um, of hope in America. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about um, the ways in which we can learn um, about the importance of embracing our shared humanity, humanity globally, right, while holding, you know, America, continue to hold America account accountable, but also holding global powers accountable as well as we you know, witness what's going on in Ukraine, but also as we continue to witness the anti-Black violence and other systemic issues that we see in the U.S. I don't really know how we can combine them, but we have to stand up for justice everywhere. And um, we got to support Ukraine. We got to go to those demonstrations just like we went to the um, apartheid demonstrations. 
we have to express our solidarity with folks, but we also have to address, you know, march for the issues here and address them however we can. And signing a petition is not the same as taking direct action. Please, okay, I know we have about a few more minutes, but please say more about that because that's a, a tangible um, step and advice, something that I think is very important. Could you say more about that, that strategy and why to me, why you make that distinction in terms of strategy? Um, on signing petitions? Yes, yes. Well, it's because some people say, you know, let's just, I've been, I've been involved, I signed a petition, I'm, let's move on, you know, like I've done yeah. my job. Signing a petition is a first step to express awareness of an issue. But you need to get together with other folks and do something about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. You know, march to get the children, don't you get weary? It's wow. necessary to be very public about what you think and not just click something on the internet. And I want to say on um, more on We Shall Overcome. Sure. I was, oh, it was a few years ago, three or four maybe, I was in Cape Town, South Africa with a group of ladies and we were doing a morning of service. I was with a group that went to a elementary school and sort of a rundown section of town and ended up with, I think, two or three other ladies in a classroom that was jam-packed with fourth graders. And we told what we did in the States. We had Q&A and then we had our closing statements. I said, um, back in the day of our civil rights movement, we had, we had a song, We Shall Overcome. I was going to say whatever difficulty you face in life, tell yourself those three words and things will get better. I didn't get to say that part. The teacher cut me right off and said, oh, we used to sing that song in our apartheid demonstrations class. Let's all sing it together. And it brought me to tears to be in a classroom all those decades later in Cape Town, South Africa, singing We Shall Overcome with a room packed with fourth graders. So you start something, you don't know how far it's going to go. Thank you so much, Ms. Mahal. We're so honored to have you, and um, we're thankful for the audience as well for joining us. I want to um, give a special thank out, thanks to uh, Loki Mahal as well, who helped uh, behind the scenes pull this together, as well as um, Reverend Kevin Brown, the Associate Director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program, our partner on this event. I'm going to turn it right back over to Lenitra and Angela so that we can close us out. But thank you so much again, uh, Ms. Mahal, for your sacrifice and your service to this country. We honor you, um, um, we honor you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I did what I did for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful conversation and this fantastic opportunity to be able to learn your story, to hear your story. And I'm just fascinated by how so many years later you can recount in such vivid detail all of all of the, the, the trials and tribulations that you went through. Um, the, for the people in the audience, I think this was really um, a, a, an inspirational evening and, and a call to action that we all need to hear, not just during Black History Month, but in every month of the year. So thank you so much, Ms. Joan, for, for coming today, for speaking to us and for sharing your story. We really appreciate it. And we just thank you again for your service. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And thank, thank everyone um, in the audience for coming today, for asking great questions, for supporting the African and African American Studies program at George Mason University. Um, th thank you for all of your, your attention and support throughout Black History Month. We've really appreciated seeing all of you. I see a few of my, my students in the class and, I, and, and I'm so glad that you all were able to join. So please stay tuned because we will we will go right into Women's History Month next month with additional programming, um, including the Sojourner Truth Lecture, which will be held tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. virtually. So um, thank you all for, for coming and um, I wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.